Okay, if everyone's ready to go, we'll get started with the next talk. Um, the next talk is by Mitchell Parker. Mitch is the Executive Director of Information Security and Compliance at Indiana University Health. I had to read that before I get that all wrong. Um, whether, it's, um, whether it's the safety of a ventilator all the way through to credit cards in the cafeteria, Mitch is responsible for the safety and security of all of those different elements. Um, his areas of interest include um, security, governance, regulatory compliance, and all those boring things. But actually, he has a regulatory compliance over everything to do with the hospital and the university issuance with them. He specializes in security, solving security problems in healthcare and all the legacy systems that are involved with that. He's spoken at a number of different security forums and events, and we're absolutely delighted to have him here today. And with no further ado, I'll hand over to Mitch. Thanks very much. Thank you very, very much. You all hear me okay? Okay. So, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. Spoken at a number of information security and healthcare conferences. First DEF CON. Hope it's definitely not the last. And thank you all so much for coming. So, the purpose of what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about replacing that constant stream of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that is usually what people consider healthcare information security. And a lot of organizations, I mean, realistically, they scare the crap out of people for the sole purpose of trying to put security in place, which doesn't exactly work very well. So that's number one reason we're here. We want to replace that with actionable intelligence. Number two, we're going to talk about implementing it. In my rule about these PowerPoint slides, and I do these slides for these presentations, is you take them, you download them, you print them out, you do whatever, put them in your office, and you read from them. I don't design these presentations to look good. I design them so you, the audience, can get something out of them. You can take back to your office or place of work the next time you need to look at them. That's the goal. So we're going to talk about implementing that. And of course, number three, profits. So why am I here? I'm here because I want to tell people how to deal with the organizational structure of healthcare organizations and how it's like a series of unstructured kingdoms operating in a loose confederation under one ruler. So you'll see it is not by coincidence I have a map of the Prussian city-states right here for a very, very good reason, because that's what most healthcare organizations are like. Of course, this changes at budget time. And of course, you've got to have the obligatory SKCD reference. So how are health, what'd you say? Cool. How are these organizations designed? They're designed to operate separately and disjointed. So you think of it this way, your departments are kingdoms, your doctors are the rulers. And medical staffs in every hospital, and in my case I got 17 different hospitals, they're all separate. Everyone gets their own budgets. And what's even more interesting, and a lot of people don't realize this, the individual physician groups and healthcare organizations can actually contract and enter into business with other healthcare organizations. I'll give a final example. Is my last job, I was the CISO at Temple University Health System for eight years. I had a neurosurgery <coughs> team I supported that was under contract for approximately seven other different hospitals. They were a profit center like no other. But you never realize it until you actually got in there and you realize. Oh, hey, these guys are actually contracting for services of other organizations. And IT is considered a, cross, is considered a cost center. And of course, all these organizations didn't get their own vendor because they all follow the golden rule, i.e. he who owns the gold makes the rules. And usually finance and support services like IT, they're considered drains on profit, innovation, and productivity. Well, we're going to change some of that today. So again. Brutal truth, these organizations are not used to centralize anything, let alone the IT team telling them how to operate. They don't work on good communication or organization, and if anything, you're dealing with a series of small businesses all working together, even with different tax ID numbers. And it's, the balkanization is crazy. So I do a lot of collaboration work with CIOs in the business, and one of my favorite things is sitting there a couple months ago, having a conversation with one of them, going, so tell me what you know. How does your private team actually look for patients that, that are you know, 
you have that Kim Kardashian issue, you have 50 people looking at someone's patient record they shouldn't be. Couldn't tell me what they were doing. And this is one of the in the country, and one of the most famous ones. So the balkanization goes all the way up to the top in a lot of cases. And it's very, very common, unfortunately. So another factor you've got to take into consideration with healthcare is that they adopted technology early and couldn't get out from under their decisions. So you go into any large healthcare organization, you will find a huge amount of legacy applications and data that they run their business off of. You will find everything from mainframes to Windows XP. Heck, you will find DOS in some places. And my favorite example, pages and faxes. The one type of organization that has an incredible usage of them is because they can't find anything better to interchange data, so they use pagers and faxes. And the departments and businesses, they want to remain fiercely independent. There's two reasons behind that. Number one, when a lot of organizations try and centralize, they do so and they say, oh yeah, we're going to centralize, but it's going to cost you X number of thousands of dollars. Best example I can give is I had an organization I was working with that was trying to standardize security cameras. And the central organization said, oh no, if you want to do this, it's going to be $12,500. To which your average small department said, $12,500 for security cameras? No, I'm going to buy my own for $10,000 less. I'm going to run them and you're not going to be involved. And I can tell you that this balkanization and this fierce independence because of high cost of centralization, it's actually led, directly led to ransomware attacks. I was at a conference several years ago, I had another CIO from a healthcare organization come right out and say, oh yeah, this organization didn't want to pay for backups, so we paid the ransomware to get their, to get their data back because it costs less than the backups. True story, happened 200 plus people in the room and kind of a shocker. And Healthcare is also risk averse. That means they purposely inhibit change. And if something is perceived as affecting workflow or efficiency, never gets done. And you will get meeting doubt in healthcare. I'm giving two examples of actual projects that I've worked on that I've been the executive sponsor for that have been, these are the amount of meetings I had to do. I am not gonna kid you, I had two leadership meetings in 45 minutes to put, put a patient privacy monitor in. It took four executives, I'd say it took about three months, four executives going to at least 25 years, we literally split up the state of Indiana and picked regions and went there. And for two-factor authentication, at least 10 different meetings, most of the time, even with the same executives in several different meetings, and sign off for multiple people. And even though a lot of the medical staff already had duo, Still, getting it in place took that many meetings. And realistically, a lot of organizations are jumping on the enterprise risk bandwagon, and what they're doing is, if you don't do the risks exactly the way that enterprise risk does, they won't even pay attention. And I've had C-suite people tell me that to my face. So, another big factor. Most people can't tell me what HIPAA is, or what it means, or what it does. They really don't understand it. They don't even understand what privacy and security rule are. All they hear is HIPAA and run. And you have significant fear, uncertainty, and doubt because no one really knows what HIPAA is. And especially when someone gets let go because they violated the HIPAA security rule or privacy rule by looking at someone's medical records, which happens a lot more than you think. They just don't publicize it like they did Jesse Smollett. And very few people understand it. And I'm gonna tell you, most of the people that actually understand HIPAA realistically, are lawyers. And lack of knowledge of HIPAA, we actually consider it to be one of the biggest stumbling blocks to inhibiting better healthcare. We put this in place to empower patients, and it's at the point where it is so unknown, and it scares so many people, that we inhibit innovation that would help patients. So, another thing we talk about is vendor fund. So, there's a lot of organizations and companies out there that will be glad to tell you that you have a problem and that you're going to get fined $5 million by the Office for Civil Rights if you don't buy their software. I'm not kidding you. 
I was in one meeting several years ago, this company said, here's your breach calculator. Here, look at the spreadsheet, how many patients you got, and for this breach, OCR is gonna find you this amount of money. And I'm not kidding you, even down to the New Jersey accents, I kind of noped out of there and was kind of happy I didn't end up in that like swampland next to MetLife Stadium. So, I mean, really, vendor FUD, these people scare them. There's one vendor in particular I'm not gonna name. Their sales pitch is, if you don't, if you don't take a meeting with us, we're gonna call your board and tell them you're not, that you're not serious about privacy and security. I have evidence, I have it in writing, I'm not naming the company. So, people that do buy that software, they get a false sense of security. So, in the words of the, one of the greatest comedians ever, Chris Rock, sit down. We have to take a look at some other complicating factors as well. Very few people have had the chance to actually understand what security is because people have not sat down with them. And risk assessments, they're considered, they scare the crap out of people. I'll be very serious. I did my first risk assessment I literally had to calm people down to tell them, I'm not going to fire you. I just want to know what's going on. I'll make it something else relevant. I had a room full of executives I was talking about the risk assessment with. I actually had a director raise their hands, and this, mind you, this is a room of 30 executives, and said to me, do you want me to say that this is answered centrally, or do you want me to write down the truth? That should tell you enough. This is a person that has been in IT over 30 years and has run IT for a pretty big hospital. That tells you what we're dealing with in healthcare. So, let's get to business. Let's get to business, let's start talking. Now that I've painted a picture of how this really works, let's talk about what we can do here. You can't effectively have good security without help. So, what you, how do you do it? How do you build it? You build an OSINT and recon program in your own organization, and because realistically, you need to be doing a better job in your information systems department than the rest of it. They only have to be concerned about keeping things up and running. You gotta be concerned about reducing risk and mitigating risk. So here's six different ways that I consider my customers to be targets. Phishing is the always a good one. Business email compromise and targeted social engineering attacks, you have no idea how good they are until you've seen some of them. They're getting to the point now of hacking small businesses that organizations do business with, getting in, inserting themselves into conversations and making such targeted, convincing emails that they fool senior finance executives. That is a major challenge that I have. Malware has always been a big one. Curious onlookers. If you thought they only go after Kim Kardashian when it comes to medical records, you're wrong. They take a look at everybody. I can tell you numerous cases over the past 20 years where people have just been curious, they've looked at these records, and that's a serious violation of privacy, and it really hurts people when you do it. And of course, you got ransomware, and my favorite new one, robocalls. I have never seen such an effective denial of service attack and those of you who know my organization know a couple of years ago, somebody sent out a few hundred thousand of them with the, with the switchboard number of one of our hospitals. Good DDoS attack on our main switchboard for a while made national news. So, brings us to corporate communications. I'll bring a little background about that. Corporations do not handle secure, do not handle communications well. And they don't handle, they don't handle communications about security well either. There's, first of all, a lot of companies have a concern about liability. They're concerned, they don't want to be liable for issuing recommendations about what people do in their personal lives or with their personal devices. Just a fact of life, I've had this told to me numerous times by other organizations. There's also a very big concern about device and social issues. So the three I listed here, Me Too, came from our corporate communications department, uh, Gamergate and social media, those are huge ones. They don't want to talk about them because most organizations don't want to take a stance because they don't want to deal with the drama. And when you have an organization, when most of these health organizations, they're huge. And when you have to deal with some of these issues, unfortunately, 
you just have a challenge because drama can blow up really quickly in a small population or a large one. And you have to make sure you align your messaging with your corporate values, which is something I didn't really appreciate well until I started writing these communications regularly on a, and doing this. And also, there's always that one use case that goes counter to what you talk about, and someone, when they talk about it, they will just hammer that use case continually. Perfect example I can give, I ran a Windows 7 upgrade project a number of years ago at a job, and one of the things I remember about running that project, I had somebody in the meeting, every meeting, without fail, we're talking about upgrading 10,000 machines. One person goes, well, I have this machine with a scanner on it. What do I do about my machine with a scanner? It got so annoying, I just kicked the person out of the meeting. But it took, but imagine dealing with that. You will have that happen all the time. And what happens is, unfortunately, some people, because they're passive aggressive, will use that to try and divert from the main issue, and they'll try and use it to attack you as well. And also, it takes a long time to navigate large companies. So, what's the first major step? Know your structure. One unique thing about healthcare is the leadership churn at the top is constant. Because one of the unspoken rules is to become a healthcare executive, you have to change jobs. You have to change organizations. I have only ever worked with one CIO that spent more than 10 years as a CIO in healthcare. Literally, to get promoted or get a better job or level up, you have to change organizations. So what happens is you have an executive class, I consider executive class director and up, that changes jobs every few years and the amount of churn you have is crazy. So I'll make a perfect example. Last job, we changed CIOs in January 2012. The last direct report to the previous CIO changed in 2016 when I left the organization. So within five years, you had a complete leadership, 100% leadership turnover in, that in the IT organization. So that's what you're dealing with. You go into the clinical areas, it's worse. And the deal is, that's not because they don't like each other, they love each other. They're all friends. Many talk and they were friends with their peers in other institutions. And you don't usually become an executive without knowing somebody. So what this leads to is that palpable disconnect between the SLT and everyone else, no matter what organization you work for. So that leads us to the other part of the structure, the people who actually know what they're doing. So that's the group that have been with the organization the largest, and they have the most history. So usually I consider that managers on down, they've been there for years, they've stuck around, and realistically, most people don't work their way up from line, from line employee to executive, they just don't but they're the ones you want to be best friends with because they know what's going on. So you have to account for that. When you're dealing with implementing security programs, there's that palpable disconnect between the executive leadership and the team members that you have to account for. And you expect there to be good communication there? There really isn't. There's a lack of knowledge on why things happen. There's a loss of organizational history between your management staff and the executives. And there's a lack of trust because, again, these people haven't been in the organization. They're not as well known. And governance, it's kind of difficult when you have to do that. So, bring us to risk assessments. So, big thing in healthcare, and again, I'm sorry if the audience is going in and out, is the risk assessment process. It's actually required by the government once a year to hand in a risk, to hand in a completed risk assessments. So, Usually when those are done, those involve directors and executives with little input from the managers. And what usually happens is to get them done, they want to get the best possible answers. So what they will do is they will actually go and handpick people that are going to fill out the risk assessments. They don't actually voluntarily ask people. They pick them. I've been in those meetings. It's actually normal behavior. So bring some more basics in past the structure. Know your business. Interview everyone you can possibly speak to. And the truth is, with active listening, people are actually gonna tell you what's, what the heck's going on. You're gonna hear more about computer security problems in your organization than you ever thought possible. You're gonna hear about the, 
You're going to hear about workarounds. You're going to hear about systems you never were documented, that were never documented. You're going to hear everything if you talk to the right people. And you, got to, you also got to understand their needs and understand their concerns. So the goal of what you have to do in building this type of program, get people to talk to you. And there's only two little things I do. And again, I'm sorry if I'm not being super technical here. I practice active listening and I follow up continually. And this, even with the personal security issues, because I'm going to tell you, I had an issue dealing with a customer about a PCI compliance issue at a hospital. I had a conversation, about 20 minute conversation with this person about my mother, her Dell computer, and the difficulty in getting set, set, everything set up for my mother. And within half an hour in the meeting, I had the PCI issues resolved. And these are some actually pretty serious technical issues. I'm not going to go into details and weaknesses in the environment, but I had the older Rakowski customer, started talking about things in my personal life that I've had to deal with, and parents. We got the issue resolved very quickly, and I drove two hours out there too. So your credibility in these organizations is based on the ability to do those two things. Because the, if you don't do this, that's what leads you to being perceived as what we call an outsider. And if you keep doing this, people are going to keep feeding you information on what's really going on in the organization. And if you don't, we're going to have the issue where people are going to, well, perceive the organization as not caring about, about them. And what happens is that's the opposite of a virtuous cycle where they don't tell you and you continue to have a lot of these issues. So another truth here, talk a little about risk assessments. They don't capture much. Here's why. There is a perception with a lot of people in upper management that when you actually do a risk assessment, that they consider it a knock on their ability to manage. They consider it showing their weaknesses. These people don't like being considered weak. And there are CIOs out there that will purposely hide bad risk assessment results. So give a perfect example about this. I ran a change management program at a job. The CIO didn't want it known that we didn't have a good one. And he purposely hid that fact from other executives so he wouldn't be perceived as being anything less than perfect. So to give you an example how bad this guy was, he would literally sit there, and his idea of employee coaching was, if, it's not, if you don't do 100%, don't do it. We, can't be see, we have to be seen as always being right. So a couple years later after he left the organization, I was having dinner with a very, very senior person from a big, from a big four firm. And first words out of this guy's mouth about this situation were Bob fucking knew. Bob being the, Bob, the late Bob Lux, former chief financial officer of the organization I worked for. So I made it my mission to resolve that issue in particular, but again, you will see this happen. And you will see it happen with security issues a lot. And a lot of the reason why people don't have security issues going to the board is because the executives that are responsible for those areas they see it as a knock against them or their, them being less than 100%. So quite frankly, they hide them. So that also goes down to the management level. There's a lot of managers who aren't telling their directors that. There are managers that want to look good to get promoted. So human nature, they hide these issues. Truth is, and this is again 11 years of being a CISO talking, people think they're hiding these issues we know they are, and we can smell BS a mile away, no matter how you think you're doing it. Another little thing about OSN I didn't put in that slide deck, make friends with everybody because they'll tell you the real story. And one of the reasons I do that is to sniff out BS when people try and hide security issues or risk issues. And I consider human nature to be security's worst enemy because of that. And people do whatever they can to look good, to say there's no risk, because realistically they think they're going to get penalized. And they think, some kid, and they think they're going to get fired. They get scared. 
they, and they're, they want to get promoted. So you have a lot of people who human nature works against us and this is what happens. So who do you make friends with? I am very happy to see a number of people wearing BOFH t-shirts today. Simon Travaglia got it right with the BOFH, the bastard operator from hell. Make friends with the cleaning staff, facilities, and security. Oh, I'm very serious, especially with the cleaning staff. They've actually been great help to me, especially when I want to find out who's been putting stuff in the not secure trash. And the PC techs, you want to find out what else is, that, what else is going on in your organization? Make friends with the people that actually service the PCs. I actually had two major cases of security issues come up because the PC techs called me up and said, uh, hey Mitch, thanks for coming over last week. Uh, we took a look at this. Something doesn't look right. Can you look into it? But what ended up happening is we found a couple major security issues because of that. Also should know you're the actual application administrators, not the ones that the directors say to go to, but the ones that actually do the work. They'll tell you a lot of things. And of course, other big tip I give, make sure you know every administrative assistant in your organization. There will be a time when you discover something and you need to get your hands on the right people. And you need to get a meeting with an executive. You're not gonna get that going to your boss. You're gonna get that about being friends with the, with the C-Suites AA. Of course, it was awkward when I was doing something with our security training program, got a one-on-one -on -one with my boss's boss, and as I was waiting to meet with my boss's boss, my boss walked out of his one-on-one -on -one with him. A little bit awkward, but that's what we had to deal with. And also, if you're in the healthcare provider space, nursing runs the organization. I don't care what the C-suite says, nursing runs the organization. I'm gonna give a real life example of this. I had an issue about Oh, I don't know, six years ago, we had a major event go on. It wasn't security related. They had to put the emergency room in a major academic health center on, the, on divert, which meant they wouldn't accept patients from the ambulances. So the person that made that call was the chief nursing officer, not the CEO sitting there, not the other members of, this, of the executive suite. No, CNO made the call. And the call center staff, again, always your best friends because they're the ones that call people when, they ha when things have to get done. So they have all the good contact information. You need to get someone's phone number? They have it. A lot of the, most of the hospitals out there run a, call, run a call system it's called American Messaging, which has all sorts of hidden fields when you look at a person with all the numbers that, quite frankly, they don't want the public knowing or other team members knowing. Make friends with them, you get those phone numbers. So another big tip I always tell people, be your own public relations firm. Why? Because no one knows who you, are, who you are if you don't advertise. And you need to get out there to go to conferences, you need to do webinars, and you need to publish articles. And we're going to talk the real reason why in a few minutes. And your customers will read them, and they will follow you on social media. Sometimes you will get people coming up to you in the cafeteria talking about your Twitter feed, too. And you need to constantly do this for outreach. Otherwise, if you don't do this, no one's going to know who you are. And I know, look, I'm a natural introvert. Most other people in security, you have a lot of very introverted people in the field. But if no one knows who you are, other people will fill the void. And this is why. Senior leadership. The people that make the decisions listen to the big four. They listen to the major analyst firms or their peers before they will listen to their own teams. I am very serious about this. And I can tell you a number of times when people have said, oh, call so-and-so first. Oh, what did so-and-so say? Replace so-and-so with a very large analyst firm based in Florida, and you'll get the picture. And you get a lot of meetings, and I have unfortunately had a lot of them, with the, I met this person at a CIO or IT executive conference who can solve all our problems meetings, i.e. the people selling snake oil that wear the slick suits. This is how they work, because they exploit the gap where leadership, because quite frankly, the executive suite moves around too much, doesn't trust their own teams, doesn't trust their own team. They fill the void, they know what they're doing, it's social engineering at its finest. 
So you've got to fill that void and you've got to be delivering a message at the conferences because it gets around. They listen when you publish, they listen when you give citations. And it's and we're talking about places like this, places like Black Hat, and places like Hymns. Not at some like vendor trade rag. And quite frankly, there's enough of them. And they also listen when you work with the standards body. So if you do work with IEEE, you do work with UL, NIST, or ISO, they're actually gonna listen to you and you're gonna be considered more credible. And I've had this discussion about credibility with the C-suites. They're big about this. So you also gotta be your own publisher. Why? Because the perception of security comes from major analyst firms, the big four, or scary ads from vendors. And there's a very good reason why every time you go to an airport, you see advertisements for computer security companies. Because that's where executives are who make decisions. I have, the only airport I have been to that did not was not completely peppered in computer security ads was King County Airport in Wisconsin. Why? Because that airport has 80% air, of the people that go to that airport are there to visit the biggest electronic medical record vendor in the country, Epic. And so the reason why this isn't good, these people that are telling the executives what to do, they don't have boots on the ground, they don't get it, they don't go to places like this. They have a lot talking about emerging technology without actually, without actually understanding what it really means. Or as I like to refer to it as, blockchain. And also the, we could have prevented that and other lies. So you've got to publish, you've got to be out there to get the word out to your customers directly and also to your senior leadership. Because I'm going to tell you, the perfect example I always give with that is passive blockchain. The reason why, they put out this technology that has significant risks. If you know what you're doing, you can do some BGP hijacking or DNS hijacking and completely screw up someone's day with blockchain. Problem is, most organizations repeated a mantra, literally, that came out of some analyst document that said, oh, this improves security. Yeah, but how? It really didn't improve security. But you have this big hype cycle, and the next thing you know, everyone's talking about it being secure when it really isn't. So that's the perfect example of what happens. So get the word out to your customers, get on a good threat intel list. If you're in higher ed and you're not working over at ISAC, you should be. You're not in healthcare, you're not, if you're in healthcare not member of HISAC, you should be. Get the word out to your friends. And we also want to avoid that circumspect march towards another high price solution that does nothing. I wanted one of those, I'd be somewhere else. So, and there's also a lot of issues and you have to be a good educator as well. Even the CIOs don't know what to do. This is an actual quote from a CIO that he said for the senior leadership team meeting three years ago. In front of 30 of his peers around the table at 7.30 in the morning because his boss loved that 7 a.m. East. So he goes, what do I need to do? Okay, Mitch, I know I need to be secure. What do I need to do? Problem is I got people telling him, buy this product when it's something else. So what you do, take everything you know, take your intelligence, take the open source intelligence, do your recon, follow up with your customers to make sure they understand. Follow up with your boss to make sure they understand. Be their guide, be their friend. Because intelligence is nothing without action, and I consider it to be less than intelligence if it isn't. So what are our end goals today? What I talked about is taking the knowledge that's out there, adapting it for the people in your organization, that's gonna be something else other than PowerPoint fodder. Replace the constant stream of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that usually defines healthcare information security, sorry, but it's the truth, with real knowledge. Not what the buzzwords are, and not what someone wants to sell or scare your senior leadership team with. And I gotta admit, there's some people out there saying some scary things, and I'm gonna say this, most of the security vendors I deal with, most of the ones that do business, try and do business with me, lie. So I remember a quote from old director of supply chain I worked with years ago. Her first words to me goes, vendors lie. I mean, that's pretty much in the security space in healthcare, that's what we see and this is what we have to combat by following what we've learned today. So what are your end goals? 
recon. You get people feeding you information. You get the team calling you. It, it's not about open. It's not about your service desk response time. It's about okay. Someone told me something. Now I have to do something about it. That's where you want to be, because you have that issue of a lot of people hiding problems and hiding risks and not telling you about them. So what you do with this at the end game by using these techniques, you reduce risk and what doing what's important, not what this is stilled up to senior management to make them look good, because realistically that's what they do. So how could you follow up? I'll leave this slide up here for everybody, and I'll be available. Follow me or DM me on Twitter. Connect, connect to me on LinkedIn. Here's my real email address, and here's my blog on CSO Online, where I post things every month, and we got some good feedback from our leadership on it. And of course, the obligatory SpongeBob. So I'll put this back here, and, I'll be, and I'll, I can take some questions from the, from the audience right now. Anyone have any, anyone have any questions? Yes? Where did you draw that line on uh, you know, turning your entire like, kind of group into a bunch of narcs for you, rather than like, I don't know, like, go out and find sources of information that you can? I don't consider it narky. I'll, I'll be very clear. I don't consider what I do or my team does narking, I consider it, you actually help people out. I'm not here to tell, I'm not here to discipline people. I'm not here to be the police. I'm here to resolve risk and address issues and help my customers do their job. And any, and I believe anyone that uses that mindset of fear, uncertainty, and doubt is perpetuating the situation, making it actually worse. I get in there, my customers are my world to me. And I want to see them, help them out, do their jobs, and be successful. And I'm not saying this from a business book. I'm saying this because I really do feel that way. And also, that whole Narcon thing, if you get caught doing it, you lose all your credibility with your customers. Yes? Yes? Your point about having distilled versions of the truth to, to aid the organization to see the correct path forward. Is there any proper position for a straight version of the truth versus a pseudo kind of distilled version, which is kind of a connotation of manipulation to say, I want to nudge you this way to the good, the good thing, but sometimes the hard version of the truth to at least accept to say, we're in a bad way, but we know we're in a bad way and we can get better. I usually use my risk assessments for that. So I do a comprehensive risk assessment every year. And so what ends up coming at it at is the risk assessment, the way I look at it is, mine ends up being about a 150 page document with lots of paragraphs, with lots of commentary in there and scoring that actually reflects how bad it really is. And I've actually had executives call my risk assessments brutal. And you have to make sure the risk assessment, which is the base of everything you do in healthcare for information security, that has to be the unvarnished, ugly as possible version of the truth. Because what ends up happening is you take the results from that, you distill them for senior leadership, you distill them for everyone else. That's when you do the nudging is on your risk management plan. Does that, that answer your question there? Any other questions from the, from the audience here? Yes? So what's the most clever hack that's ever been deployed? Uh, you really put me, put me there on that one. I'm going to have to say the most clever was a business email compromise that I saw, and it was actually a few years ago, where they took advantage of the fact that the other organization I was working with didn't have SPF and was making very convincing, almost down to the level of like, even with the headers, ways of spoofing information so that it looked really, really real to the point where it, took, it actually got up to corporate treasurer who's basically called bullshit on it and said, I don't think this is right. Also, I had an almost successful ransomware attack three years ago where I had the CFO of a hospital got a piece of, got a forged PDF that contained ransomware that was from an actual vendor of his that referenced actual orders. 
and had he double clicked on it, I would have been in a bad way, and so would have he. But that piece of ransomware attack that was so convincing and real that it actually looked like a real vendor invoice and it literally had real invoice data in it. That I think is the most clever. Any other questions? Thank you, but, thank you very much. Thank you very much.